Good evening. It's good to see each of you here this Wednesday evening. If you'd like to mark number 119, 119, that'll be the song of invitation at the conclusion of our lessons. Before our prayer and dismissal to class, we'll sing number 669, 669. You have to use your books. 669. There is a bomb in Gilead to make the wounded whole. There is a bomb in Gilead to heal the sin sick soul. Sometimes I feel. Let's pray. Our Father in heaven, we thank you so much for all the many blessings that you have given us. We thank you for the rain that you have sent our way. We pray that you will be with those who have been affected by the storms, and we pray that you will be with those who may be in harm's way now. We pray that you will be with them. We pray, God, that you will be with those who are sick. We pray that you will restore them back to their much wanted and needed help. We pray that you will be with those who may be traveling at this time. We pray that they may have a safe trip to their destination. We thank you, God, for this time we have now to come and to study a portion of your word. We pray that you will be with the teachers. We pray that they may remember those things that they have studied and that they may present them in such a way that they will be easily understood. We pray that you will be with us as students who are listening to the lesson and that we may take those things and that we may apply them to our lives so that we may become uh, the Christians that you would have us to be and that we will let our lights shine that others may see our good works and glorify you in heaven. Pray that you will be with us now through the rest of this service. Forgive us when we sin, for it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Good evening, one and all, and welcome this evening to the Bremen Church of Christ. We're thankful for your presence, for braving the storm and coming out tonight. Thankful for everyone that's here, and especially any who may be visiting with us tonight at Bremen. We'll dismiss our classes now with the nursery, preschool, kindergarten, and elementary school classes.
middle school, high school, and adult classes are dismissed. Proverbs chapter 15 <clears throat> be our place of study this evening as we continue working our way through this book of instruction from God through the matter of inspiration and things that will help us in our Christian lives to be more what God would have us be. Uh, each of these verses for the most part is, <clears throat> is an independent thought that if we would uh, just take the time to apply it, would make a difference in the way we live our lives. And so we're down to chapter 15. <clears throat> he begins by saying, A soft answer turneth away wrath, but grievous words stir up strife. When you see that, of course, there <clears throat> are any number of other verses that might come to mind. <clears throat> One of the things that we have emphasized up to this point and will continue to emphasize is how many times we have reference to words, lips, tongue, speech of some sort. And as we've also emphasized previously, obviously God wants us to understand that that is a major problem source, our speech, what we say how we say it. And sometimes it's <clears throat> what we say and how we say it. Sometimes it's what we say. Sometimes it's how we say what we say. But in this particular verse, he gives us two options. He gives us the option of a soft answer. <clears throat> and again, there are uh, other verses that could be uh, thrown into that mix. But the idea of wise words, and how, how often have we noticed the concept of wisdom and understanding and knowledge as we have worked our way through the Proverbs to this point? And so with the knowledge that we have of God's will, the wisdom to, to use it, <clears throat> then we come to a verse like this, and it tells us more about our speech and the proper use of it. Can you think of any New Testament passages that might express the same or similar sentiment in that regard? <clears throat> Anybody? Let your speech... <clears throat> what? Let your speech be always with grace, seasoned with salt. <clears throat> That's an expression that that Paul used on one occasion. In um, Romans chapter 12 and in verse 18, and we've noted this passage uh, recently in another lesson, but Paul would write, <clears throat> If it be possible, as much as lieth in you, live peaceably with all men. Now what does that have to do with this verse? Does it have anything to do with this verse? <clears throat> now basically what he's saying in this verse is you can either calm the storm or you can intensify it. All by the choice of words that you have in a given situation. So if I'm going to apply Romans 12 in that regard to do everything I can to be at peace, what kind of an answer am I going to give <clears throat> in any circumstance? 
a soft answer. I'm not going to take the liberty. You know, sometimes people have the idea <clears throat> when they say things, uh, maybe things they should not say, uh, say things in a way they should not say them. They, they try to excuse themselves by saying, well, you should have heard the way they spoke to me. Really? What does that prove to a Christian? So they spoke to you unkindly. So they spoke to you in a harsh manner. So they spoke cruel words to you. Does that give you the right or liberty as a child of God who's trying to be at peace with people to return the favor, so to speak? Absolutely not. And it's not uncommon in our day and time. <clears throat> it seems like the further we go in time, the less concerned people are about the way they speak to you sometimes. And yet we have to remember who we are. Uh, people can be critical. Pe people can be harsh. They can be cruel with their speech. But what are we supposed to be? We're supposed to be Christians. We're supposed to be people who, who respond in a different way than, than people of the world in that regard. And so we can either <clears throat> turn away wrath or we can stir it up. We can either turn the heat down or we can turn the heat up just by the answer that we might give in a given situation. And then where does he go in verse 2? The tongue. There's that word again. The tongue of the wise useth knowledge aright, but the mouth of fools poureth out foolishness. Well, what's the difference in verse 2 and verse 1 in principle? Really none. <clears throat> because he's saying generally the same thing. In other words, if, if we will be wise in the way we speak, what kind of an answer are we going to give? We're going to give that soft answer. That's what wisdom would, would dictate. And so uh, we're using knowledge aright in that, in that regard. But otherwise, uh, we're just pouring out foolishness. But then in verse 3, he shifts gears to another concept. He says, The eyes of the Lord are in every place, beholding the evil and the good. <clears throat> now, if you were going to Try to think of some biblical character that portrays this proverb. Who might that character be? Uh, Jonah? That would probably be a good answer. Uh, why do we think of Jonah? I mean, the Lord had said to him, go to Nineveh. And so he went. Do it like this. He went... <laughs> He went the opposite direction. He went the opposite direction. Now, when he made some contact with the Lord after a little bit of distraction there, then you can do like this. He went on to Nineveh then, didn't he? But the Lord had to convince him to go to Nineveh. How did the Lord know where he was? I mean, here he was on a ship headed in the opposite direction. You wouldn't think the Lord would be looking for him there. The eyes of the Lord are in every place. There's the answer. Uh, <clears throat> there are other, other passages in that regard. And of course, with regard to Jonah, it simply says to us that it doesn't matter where we go. We cannot get away from our responsibility. And that's what Jonah was trying to do in that regard. Uh, we mentioned recently in another, in another study, but it relates here as well. What about Achan? When the Israelites had crossed Jordan and took the city of Jericho, what did Achan do? He took of some of those things, some of the spoils that were not to be taken for personal use, hid them under his tent. Well, who knew about that? The Lord knew about that. Did anybody else know about it at that point? Doesn't seem that they did. Uh, maybe possibly part of his family, but, but as far as everybody else, as far as we know, nobody else knew about it. But the Lord knew about it. Why? Because the eyes of the Lord in every place. Now, 
There's a, a song that we sing. There's some all-seeing eye watching you. But there's an interesting thought within this verse. How often when we think about that song, there's an all-seeing eye watching you, or, or that concept, the eyes of the Lord in every place, how often do we think about that only in connection with evil? You better watch out. God knows what you're doing. Now that, that's generally the way we think about it. But this verse puts both sides in there. He knows, yes, he does know the evil. His eyes are in every place. He knows what's going on, things that ought not to be going on. But what about those who are doing good? He knows that as well. To me, that's at least one of the most encouraging thoughts as, as a child of God. You know, sometimes we get discouraged. We get a little bit um, down in the mouth, as we say, because it, it seems like with all of the, the efforts of good that we do, little good is being accomplished. But where's the point of comfort in that? How often have we said when we've, when we've done some of our door knocking and campaign work here and uh, with seemingly little uh, results involved, how do we comfort ourselves in that? We have done what we were supposed to have done. And God knows that. Why? Because the eyes of the Lord in every place. He sees the good, He sees the evil. And so while we need to be conscious of the fact that, that there's no uh, hiding from God, uh, as a matter of fact, Psalm uh, 139 uh, talks about uh, paraphrasing a little bit. You know, if I go to the, to the darkest spot on the face of this earth, is God going to be able to see me there? Yes, he says, just like a, just like a light shining around you. Uh, you can go to the highest mountain. You can't escape the presence of God. You can go to the depths of the deepest sea. You cannot escape the presence of God. So it really doesn't matter in that regard. You just can't escape the presence of the Lord, and the fact that He sees everything that's going on. Now, He beholds evil, yes, but He also beholds the good. What does that say about summer vacations? I know it's not summertime. But what does that say about summer vacations? You, you leave home, you leave your community, you leave the uh, physical side of the elders, you, you know, you just, you're, you're in an area where in all probability nobody knows you, although I don't know that I've ever been anywhere that I didn't run into somebody that knew somebody that I knew. But, but we think we're in an area where nobody knows us, how do we act? Do we act any differently than if we were around our brothers and sisters in Christ? After all, the eyes of the Lord are in every place. And so how, how we operate uh, on the job, how we operate in, in recreational pursuits, wh whatever it is, the eyes of the Lord are in every place. Now, if we, would, if we would maintain a consciousness of that, would it have any bearing at all on how we act sometimes? It should. If we care anything about what God thinks, it should make a major difference in our activities. Then in verse 4, where does it go back to? It goes right back to the top. I mean, if we can't get the point, we obviously are pretty dense. God wants us to know that there's a problem here. A wholesome tongue is a tree of life, but perverseness therein is a breach in the Spirit. Now, we, we went through that, that list uh, of references and how many times the tongue, the lips, the mouth, the words, 
all of that was mentioned. Go back to um, go back to chapter eleven, just a minute, uh, within the Proverbs, and notice notice what he says in that regard. Chapter eleven, and in verse uh, thirteen. A talebearer. Who is that? That's the same person who's speaking perverseness over here in chapter 15. It hasn't changed in that regard. It's a person of the same nature. That talebearer revealeth secrets. But he that is of a faithful spirit concealeth the matter. Now notice. Here, he uses just the opposite. Here, he talks about the, the breach of spirit. Back in chapter 11, he talks about the faithful spirit. Here, here's just the opposite in, in this to what we've, what we've already noted. Uh, of course, James chapter 3, uh, a lot of other verses could be mentioned in that regard. In verse 6, we notice a little more on materialism, and we've, we've noted some of that uh, previously. In the house of the righteous is much treasure, but uh, in the revenues of the wicked is trouble. If you want to really get a good concept of the latter part of verse 6, just go back and read 1 Timothy chapter 6, beginning with verse 6. Godliness with contentment is great gain. Then he goes on to talk about those who are rich, that is, in this world's goods, all of the possible trouble spots that they could have in their life, the temptations that come along, the trouble that can come along with material possessions. Well, that being the case, what are the treasures in the house of the righteous? Is he not talking about material things there? No, he's not talking about material things there. A man who is righteous is rich, regardless of what he does or does not have materially, is he not? You remember the statement that was made with regard to Christ? Though he was rich, yet for your sakes, my sake, he became poor for what reason? that I might be rich. Materially? No. That's not his concern at all. Concern is spiritual wealth. You think about Jesus' statement, lay not up for yourselves treasures on earth. Well, what about the, what about the person in the latter part of verse 6? Who is that person? That's the person that's laying up treasures on earth. Material things. What's going to happen to those things? Moth and rust are going to corrupt. Thieves could break through and steal. But if we lay up treasure in heaven, moth and rust can't get to it. Thieves can't get to it. It's going to be there. And so the wealth that he's considering here is the wealth as the wicked would look at it versus the riches of the righteous. And they're not the same thing. Although that is not to suggest for a moment that is that it is inherently sinful for an individual to have much of this world's goods. If he has obtained it in a proper way and uses it in a proper way, there's absolutely nothing wrong with it. But it matters not how little or how much. When this world ends, where is that going to be? Burned up, along with everything else. What's really going to last of the treasures that we've laid up in heaven. And yet, what is the direction of our world tonight? What, what is really the focus of, of the minds of, of so many people tonight? The, the collection of material things, wanting more, trying to get more, doing whatever they can do to get more. For what? For what? Just more trouble. But when this life is over, those who have stored up for themselves spiritual riches will have something they can literally take with them. Notice in verse 7, he mentions the lips again. Verse 8, the sacrifice of the wicked is an abomination to the Lord, 
but the prayer of the upright is his delight. Take your Bible just a minute and, and turn back to the book of Isaiah. Isaiah, in, in chapter 1, gives a, a very vivid description of, um, of the people of Judah and Jerusalem, as is mentioned in verse 1. In verse 2, he says, Hear, O heavens, give ear, O earth, for the Lord hath spoken. I have nourished and brought up children, and they have rebelled against me. The ox knoweth his owner, and the ass his master's crib. But Israel doth not know, my people doth not consider. Ah, sinful nation, a people laden with iniquity, a seed of evildoers, children that are corruptors. They have forsaken the Lord. They have provoked the Holy One of Israel unto anger. They are gone away backward. Now, how would you, if you knew no more about the people of that day than what we've just read, what would you, how would you consider their attention to God? I mean, just, just look at what he says. Sinful nation, laden with iniquity, seed of evildoers, children that are corruptors, forsaken the Lord, provoked the Holy One of Israel to anger, gone away backward. If that's all you knew about them, would you think that these people are in any way, shape, form, or fashion in touch with God? I wouldn't think so. I wouldn't think so. But now drop down to verse 11. What are they doing? What are they doing in verse 11? To what purpose is the multitude of your sacrifices? Unto me? What are they doing? They're not just offering a few sacrifices. They're offering a multitude of sacrifices unto the Lord. So they're still trying to be in touch with God. Then I look at what he says. I am full of the burnt offerings of rams and fat of fed beasts. I delight not in the blood of bullocks or of lambs or of he goats. When you come to appear before me, who hath required this at your hand to tread my courts? Bring no more vain oblation. Incense is an abomination unto me. Then he goes on to the new moons, the Sabbath, the calling of assemblies. He said, just cut it out. Cut it out. Stop it. It's an abomination as long as you're going to live the way you're living. Well, that is exactly what the proverb writer says here in verse 8. The sacrifice of the wicked is an abomination to the Lord. Now, what's an application of that to us? Yes, sir. Exactly. That's true. It is. It is. When we, when we come to worship on Sunday and we live like the devil Monday through Saturday, of what benefit is our worship on Sunday or our attempt to worship? Would it not, would it not fall into this category? That's right. Uh, he's mentioning Saul here when he went out to, uh, supposed to have utterly destroyed the Amalekites and brought back some of the animals, even with excuse, we brought them back for sacrifice. To obey is better than sacrifice, and to hearken than the fat of rams is what he was told. And so uh, a, a worship on Sunday is not going to cover up a week worth of sins, folks. It's an abomination to God. If you think back to the statement that Jesus made, if you, and, and keep in mind the, the time period here before the end of the old law and the beginning of the new, that he said, if you bring your gift to the altar and remembers that thy brother hath ought against thee, do what? Leave 
that sacrifice at the altar. Go and first be reconciled, then come and offer the gift. And so, if you know, if there's, if there's animosity, ill will, whatever you might want to call it between brethren, and we come into the house of the Lord and go through the motions of worship, we need to realize what that does to God. It makes Him sick. That is serious stuff, folks. When we think about how we live our lives on a daily basis, and then to come into an assembly and, and go through the motions of singing and praying and studying and, you know, whatever, and partaking the Lord's Supper on the first day of the week, um, how we live, and, and to me that's one of the, uh, Psalm 50 is, is one of the best sections of Scripture uh, to help us understand how our lives on a daily basis affect our worship on the Lord's Day. It's a great section of Scripture. We need to maybe spend more time there sometimes. So, so, you know, the way we dress, the way we talk, our honesty or dishonesty in, in business dealings, and then we come into worship on Sunday or any other time, it's an abomination to the Lord. Our interest in God on Sunday and our interest in God Monday through Saturday must harmonize, must harmonize. And so we need to give careful consideration. Now, with that in mind, go right back up to verse 3. What did it say? The eyes of the Lord are in every place. And so he knows what's going on in our lives. Whether we want to admit it or not, he knows. Worship for conscience sake, or worship to keep up a reputation, those are wrong motives for worship. They won't be acceptable to God. But then in the latter part of the verse, but the prayer of the upright is his delight. Now think about that for a moment. Just a prayer from a faithful child of God delights our Heavenly Father. You think about that for a little bit. To know that, that He, not only are His eyes in every place, but the fact that when we go to Him in prayer, he, He's delighted about that. He wants us to pray to Him. He commands us to pray, yes. Pray without ceasing, 1 Thessalonians 5. But how does it affect him? Well, this verse says he delights in it. Makes him happy, if you please. When the righteous pray to him. You know, if there were no other reason, that would be a pretty good reason to pray, wouldn't it? Just to know that it makes God happy when we pray beside all of the benefit that it has for us in that regard. Then um, he goes ahead in, in some of these other verses. He talks about uh, correction. Well, in verse 9, there's the word abomination again. Uh, in verse 10, he deals with correction. We've already looked at that on a, on a, on a number of, uh, of occasions. Uh, Come on down to uh, verse 13. We, we usually like that verse pretty well. A merry heart maketh a cheerful countenance, but by a sorrow of the heart the spirit is broken. Do you remember anything about Nehemiah as recorded in Nehemiah chapter 2 about his countenance? you remember anything about that at all? He had just found out Israel had been destroyed. Jerusalem was basically no more. And what was he asked? What's wrong? What's wrong? Have you ever looked at anybody in the face 
and you could tell just by the expression on their face, they had either just had something very exciting happen in their lives or something very distressful had just happened in their lives. You can tell by their countenance. Somebody walks up to you and they say, what's wrong? Oh, no, no nothing. Either. No. Something about your countenance has said to them, something's wrong. Now, you may not want to talk about it, but something's wrong. But a merry heart maketh a cheerful countenance. Puts a smile on your face, if you please. So if you don't want people to know how you feel, you better watch your face, because it'll say a lot about you. I don't remember who the brother was now. Years ago, uh, at some workshop, he got up and he said, Is everybody here today happy? Well, I don't know what the response was, but directly he said, well, would you please notify your face? Well, we were obviously sitting around with long faces because it appeared we were not very happy at that point. But that's what this verse says. Our countenance says a lot about us in that regard, whether things are going right or whether things are, are going wrong. In verse 16, better is little with the fear of the Lord than great treasure and trouble therewith. Here again, material things can be trouble to us. But notice verse 17. I like this verse. Better is a dinner of herbs where love is than a stalled ox and hatred therewith. Somebody put that in your own words. Come on, Roger, help me out here. Turnip greens with a little love is better than a T-bone with hatred and bitterness. Isn't that what he's really saying here? If you don't like turnip greens, you can put something else in there. It's hard to digest, to say the least, isn't it? But again, you, you, think about, you think about the world in which you and I live today. What, what are they interested in? More material things, more treasure. But if we've got the, the, the needs of life, and of course it makes us think about what, what we really treasure in life. What is it that we really treasure in life? Material things are not all there is to it. Our attitude, our disposition is at the root of what we really treasure in life. I think about Matthew chapter 5. What, what do we call the first, well, from verse 3 through verse 12, what, what do we call those verses? We call them Beatitudes. I like to think of it as the attitudes that must be. That's really what it is. Attitudes that must be. Attitude, disposition, goes a long way in, in our happiness and our contentment here in this life. What do, we, what do we instill in our children? When they cry, we give them what they want. What are we saying to them? Happiness can be found in things. That's not always true. Sometimes we need to teach a little contentment rather than more things. We need to be sure that we're instilling in, in our young people, whether it's our children at home, our young people at church or whatever, the connection between right attitudes and right values. Verse 19, he talks about, well, verse 18 and 19, talks about a wrathful man in verse 18, talks about a slothful man in verse 19. We've looked at those concepts uh, previously. Look at verse 20. A wise son maketh a glad father, but a foolish man despiseth his mother. 
Now that's, that's almost where we started with the Proverbs, isn't it? Back in chapter 1. With the instruction of the father and the mother, how it's received, and the impact that's going to have on father and mother. And again, that's what he's, that's what he's getting to in this, in this regard. In verse 23, a man hath joy by the answer of his mouth, and a word spoken in due season, how good it is. Do you always know what to say in every situation of life? No. I, I hear people all the time with, with especially terminal illness, in the case of death, in the case of some extreme tragedy in somebody's life, I'd really love to go see them. But I don't know what to say. What's the answer to that? You don't have to. You don't have to say anything. Sometimes saying nothing is better than spouting off at the mouth when you don't know what you are talking about. But sometimes just just your physical presence. We don't always know the right thing to say at at the right time, and so sometimes it's just better to say nothing. But always, you know, lend that support and encouragement as we have, as we have opportunity. Verse twenty-five: The Lord will destroy the house of the proud; but He'll establish the border of the widow. Destroy the house of the proud. What other verse comes to mind in that same vein within the Proverbs? Pride goeth before a fall. That's it. And so, um, when we want to, we want to be careful about our disposition in that regard. We don't want to become proud because of the end result. Now, look at the contrast in verse twenty-six. The thoughts of the wicked are an abomination of the Lord. And there's that word abomination. And incidentally, what does the word abomination really mean? What? Something that is sickening to God. Loathsome, sickening to God. So the very thoughts of the wicked are an abomination of the Lord, but the words of the pure are pleasant words. Tremendous contrast in that regard. And again, there's that concept of, of words and thoughts again. As he thinketh in his heart, so is he. Keep thy heart with all diligence. Out of the end of the issues of life. And so keeping the heart pure keeps our thoughts pure. Then in verse 27, another proverb that deals with materialism. He that is greedy of gain troubleth his own house, but he that hateth gifts shall live. How would one who is greedy trouble his own house? I mentioned just recently in some other connection of a situation I saw on one occasion where a man was standing at a counter at a convenience store buying a, one of those tickets, you know, scratching it off, throwing it in the garbage, buy another one, scratch it off, throw it in the garbage. And his son standing there with him didn't look like he'd had any new clothes for years. Looked very pitiful. What was that man doing? He was allowing his own greed to trouble his own house. Paul said if a man will provide, provide not for his own, 
He's denied the faith and is worse than an infidel. That doesn't put that individual in good company, does it? So we need to be careful. I, uh, we had this conversation, I don't know with whom recently, but, but I made the comment that I didn't understand it for years, how at home when, when mother would, would fry chicken, uh, she didn't, there wasn't a lot thrown away back then. She fried nearly everything. But I never could understand why my dad thought the back was the best part of the chicken. But he did. At least he said he did. He always wanted the back. You know, there's a little bit of meat around on it, but not very much. Why was, why was it the best part of the chicken to him? Because he was allowing the kids to have the better part. Yeah. Oh, and I used to love the neck. Not for any greedy, selfish reason. I just loved it. But, but that was his concept. And that's, that's just the exact opposite of what we're, what we're dealing right here. A greedy man would take the best part and let the kids worry about themselves. But a greedy man will cause trouble. He, he doesn't care who he causes trouble for, actually. Friend or foe or family. The heart of the righteous studieth to answer, but the mouth of the wicked poureth out evil things. Now there's that concept again, the mouth. How much trouble it can get us into, how much harm it can do. Basically what he's saying here is, don't just always say what comes to mind. Some people are bad about that. I mean, whatever comes to their mind, you can bet it's coming out the mouth. They don't care what it is or how they say it. But he says here that a righteous person will think about what they say before they say it. Give some thought to it. Go back up to the earlier verse. Soft answer. Here's the, here's the person that gives that soft answer right here. It's the righteous person who gives thought to what they say. Verse 30. The eyes, of the light of the eyes rejoiceth the heart, and a good report maketh the bones fat. The, eye, the light of the eyes rejoice the heart. A good report maketh the bones fat. What does a word of commendation do for you? Makes you feel good, usually. Somebody give you a little pat on the back or say something good about you. But you give somebody a complaint and watch them swell up. They don't like it. They can't handle it. So it would help us to understand that, you know, we can encourage people by giving points of, of condemnation. Well, that's the end of our time. Lord willing, we'll look at uh, chapter 16 in our study next week. Just really good, everyday, practical instruction from the God above to help me live my life where it will make Him happy.
the announcements before our invitation this evening. Conice Harper, the niece of uh, Frank and Lola, uh, continues at Wesley Woods Hospital. Her address is uh, on the bulletin board for those who wish to send her well wishes. Rosemary Evans has been in intensive care at Higgins in Bremen. She's now been moved to a room at Higgins, room 238. She's not doing well, so we should remember her and the family at this time in our prayer. Scott Williams is also home from the hospital, and we're hopeful that he is doing well. Good. We extend our sympathy to uh, Richard and Shirley Smallwood in the passing of Richard's sister-in-law, Wileen Smallwood. Uh, we don't have any arrangements. Does anyone know what the arrangements are? Do not know. Any others that we should mention? Thanksgiving Ladies Luncheon, Saturday, November the 19th, 11.30 a.m. There's a sign-up list in the foyer. Hopefully you've already signed up. In connection with that, there are some men that are needed to move some tables and the lattice work around tonight after the services, so if you would help us with that event, please. The Georgia Agape Thanksgiving Day Appeal is upcoming Sunday, November the 20th, which is a week from, no, it's this coming Sunday. Is that right? This coming Sunday. Thanksgiving prayer and song service is next Wednesday night. So we're looking forward to that. Next Wednesday night. There's a wedding shower for Caitlin Adams on Sunday, November the 27th from 2 to 4 p.m. She's registered at Beth Beth and Beyond in Target. Shower Group 1 is to host this event. That's again a week from Sunday, November the 27th, 2 to 4 p.m. here at the building. Ladies uh, luncheon, or uh, ladies Devo, devotional and lunch, uh, Thursday, December the 1st at 11 a.m. Holiday parties upcoming, believe it or not, Saturday, sept or December the 3rd. Saturday, December the 3rd, holiday party, 5 p.m. here at the building. There's a holiday outing scheduled for nursery through 6th grade in the fellowship hall Sunday, December the 11th. After the morning worship service, we'll have more information about this as we get a little bit closer to it. Sue Gross has a good washer and dryer in good working condition. First come, first serve. For those who have need of that, see Sue for more information. Carrie Wilson would like to meet with the new teachers or those teaching the nursery classes through first grade next quarter. Carrie Wilson would like to meet with you immediately after services down front. Brother Martin. We may all hold something precious or great value in our lives, such as a picture of a family, remember a piece of jewelry, or even a piece of furniture. Will we ever want to give up something that precious? Christ was precious. He gave up his life for us so that we can have obtained salvation through him and have reconciliation with God, 2 Corinthians 5, verses 18 through 21. Some people will not obey the gospel and let Christ in. There are some that will let him in, but only while things are going well. Or until trouble or adversity arises, then they forget about Christ. Will we not let him in? Or will we let him in for a little while? Or will we let him in to stay with us? One reason why people will not let him in is that they fear they can lose their friends because their friends do not have anything to do with God. However, the Proverbs writer says a man that hath friends must show himself friendly, and there is a friend that sticketh closer than a brother. Proverbs chapter 18, verse 24. We know that Christ is a friend to the friendless. Jesus stated in John 15, verses 13 through 15, Greater love hath no man than this, that a man lay down his life for his friends. Ye are my friends, if you do whatsoever I have commanded you. But I have called you friends. What a privilege it is to have the Son of God as our friend. Another reason why people don't let him in is because of pride. We know that pride is a satisfaction derived from our own achievements. So many believe that if they let Christ in their lives, they may not become successful in business or in life. They want to trust in themselves and their abilities. 
In Jeremiah chapter 10, verses 23, the Lord says, O Lord, know that the way of the man is not in himself. It is not in man that walketh to direct his steps. Man cannot put his faith in a changeless person, but can put his faith in a changeless God. God resisteth the proud. 1 Peter verse 5, chapter 5, verse 5. Man needs God. One reason why people will let him in, but for a little while, is that they face hardships in their lives. At the beginning of the Christian life, after one has obeyed the gospel, having been baptized, and walking in newness of life, there may be hardships that, they, that arise. These hardships come to all of us, not just new babes in Christ. However, because of these hardships, some will fall away. Christ says in Mark 13, verse 13, And ye shall be hated of all men for my name's sake. But he that endure unto the end, the same shall be saved. In 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 3, it says, Thou therefore endure hardness as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. In 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 12, it says, Yea, and all that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. Christ was also tempted, but did not compromise the truth of God's word and remained faithful. Matthew chapter 4, verses 1 through 11. Lastly, will we let him in to stay with us? In Revelation 3, verses 20, Jesus said, Behold, I stand at the door and locked. If any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come into in him and will sup with him and he with me. This shows fellowship with our Savior. However, in order for one to enjoy such sweet fellowship, they must obey his voice. And being made perfect, he became the author of eternal salvation to those that obey him. Hebrews chapter 5, verse 9. If he is to stay with us, then we must want to conform to him. We must let Christ live with us. In Ephesians chapter 3, verses 16 through 17, it says that he would grant you according to the riches of his glory to be strengthened with might by his spirit in the inner man, that Christ may dwell in your hearts by faith, that ye be rooted and grounded. The Bible tells us to walk in him. As ye have received Christ Jesus, I'm sorry, Christ the Lord, so walk ye in him, rooted and built up in him, and establish in the faith as ye have been taught, abounding therein with thanksgiving. Colossians 2, verses 6 through 7. Peter tells us in 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 18, to grow in grace and in knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. We will have a triumph in Christ. 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 14. We will ultimately have salvation in Christ. Acts 4, verse 12. Our life will always be much better now and eternally if we let Christ stay with us. Tonight you have an opportunity to respond to the Lord's invitation. If you desire to put off that old man of sin and put on that new man by being baptized, you have the opportunity to do so tonight. Or if you are a child of God and have fallen away and desire to come back home, you too also can respond to this invitation. If you have any need, come as we stand and sing.
you pray with me, please? Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for this, another day of life that you've blessed us with. We're thankful for the rain that you've blessed with us. We're thankful for all the many blessings you've bestowed upon us. Father, we thank you you for this hour that we've been able to study another portion of thy word. We pray that we will take it and apply it to our everyday lives. Father, we pray for those that were unable to be with us this evening, whether they be traveling or sick. We pray that if it is thy will, you will return them back to us at the next appointed time. We pray that you will go with us now as we go our separate ways and bring us back at the next appointed time. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.